you. So I'm just thankful that you guys are here still. Um, I'm just going to start off because um, I, I just did try to get off to not get excited or anything, but I'm going to read a little bit from it because this section, if I can see. you know, old prison, you know, with three people per cell, and I was being transferred over to Grand Valley, Prison for Women, which is a lot like the Fraser Valley, Prison for Women, and en route, we stopped at what is called, well, it's euphemistically called Lindsay, it's actually called the Correctional, or the Central East Correctional Center, but I'm going to call it Lindsay, <clears throat> instead of using all these acronyms, and it's very stereotypical of the modern day prison of today, that you that, you know, you'll find remnants of it in a lot of the uh, um, federal prisons, and, and it's like the model in Ontario for the provincial prisons. So I think it'll give you an idea of what more modern day prisons are like. Um, first of all, I'm not going to read this part, but when I say they, I'm referring to there were two provincial prisons that were built identical. One was in Lindsay, one was in Penitent. So I, I sort of act architecturally, they resemble other members of the super prison family, which can be spotted from the air in poverty-stricken rural areas bordering small towns across North America, looking like huge spiders with their legs splayed out across the barren landscape. The spider's body is the administrative hub of the building, where the main bubble is situated, and the legs are the pods, where the mini bubbles and living units of the prisoners are located. The 1,200 prisoners are imprisoned in six self-contained octagonal pods, each able to hold 192 prisoners. The main bubble is the brain of the building, a glass-walled surveillance hub manned by at least one guard who monitors banks of closed-circuit TVs, and with the flip of a switch, the corresponding audio feed 24-7. The barren landscape is typical because no, new prisons are usually located near economically depressed small towns in rural areas far from the families of the prisoners. Once I've been shuffled out inside, I've been transported there to cop car, I realized that the only thing that distinguished the, admis the admissions and discharge area from that in Quinty was a fresh coat of paint. The Feng Shui was Kafkaesque. There were no pictures or adornments of any kind, nothing to distinguish this area from another except the color of the paint. I was struck by the fact that everything was either numbered or caged, including the light bulbs and the people. I still can't get my federally sentenced prison number, 5 P FPS 532914B, out of my head. As soon as my handlers, which is the cops, and I stepped through the, the doors, we were greeted by two guards with clipboards who who started asking the cops my vital statistics. With the first question, my name, I instinctively began to answer when one of the cops cut me off. I realized that I was like a hologram, and the only real, reliable people were my OPP, which stands for Ontario Provincial Police Handlers. So I took on the usual generic, expressionless, silent prisoner persona. I began to understand why so many poor people are willing to appear on television shows like Jerry Springer and Dr. Phil. Why would anyone voluntarily humiliate themselves on live television in front of millions of people? Those who are invisible, irrelevant, and useless in this society will often do anything, no matter how degrading, to be recognized for once as, as alive, relevant, and useful. Despite having been strip searched in Quinty just before leaving and having had no contact with anyone since, I was strip searched again and given a pair of dark green prison sweats, the color code of provincial prisoners. Gray was for, for federally sentenced women and purple was for prisoners being transported. If they put our prison number on the front of our colored prison sweats, we could have been considered labeled and branded for scanning just like groceries on the checkout counter. If I could only snuff out my political conscience, I would trademark that idea. Once admitted, I was left alone in a holding cell where the architectural lines made by the poor concrete benches and privacy walls were round, leaving no sharp edges, the architectural enemy of prison construction. 
Even the profiles of the stainless steel toilet sink module conformed to this roundedness. I assumed a hole in the floor was where the water would drain after they'd spray clean the room with the high pressure holes like a bloody abattoir. I realized I was not alone when I heard the voice of a woman with a Jamaican accent in another holding cell yelling into the phone. She was probably yelling to avoid wasting any time or money on speaking words since the Millennium phone system is very expensive. Even local calls are collect. This is a new computerized phone system designed explicitly for the prison system. Once admitted, a prisoner submits a limited number of phone numbers for approval. All calls are automatically recorded and cost more than the same calls would outside prison. In prison, where the social yardsticks outside the walls are irrelevant, I've noticed that many educated middle-class prisoners will avoid speaking in their native middle-class educated dialect. Instead, they will embrace the dialects associated with illiteracy in outlaw neighborhoods, dialects that will reinforce their otherness distinct from the enemy, the prison regime, and the outside society. Finally, one of the clone light guards came to escort me to my pod. They were wearing all-season unisex clothing to match the all-season gender-neutral atmosphere of the place. The building was either air-conditioned or heated to an optimal temperature for a working guard. And considering that there were no windows or clocks, it was impossible to know what time of day or season it was. A constant, subtle hum emanated from the building, contributing to the impression that the building was alive and could I bet you that was suspenseful. You guys must have seen that one coming. <laughs> okay. All right, here. That won't stop me, though. All right. Where was I here? A uh, constant, subtle hum emanated from the building, contributing to the impression that the building was alive and controlled the people. Whether the hum came from the heating, cooling system, the fluorescent lights, the all-pervasive electronic system, or all of the above doesn't really matter. The hum was a constant reminder of the building's presence, unlike the guards who walked silently around in soft-soled shoes and disappeared into bubbles surrounded by one-way black glass. Most of the time, the only human sound other than the prisoners was a robotic-sounding voice periodically echoing down the corridors from the two-way intercom system. We walked silently down a series of identical corridors distinguished only by the walls painted in different bright colors as we passed from one pod into the next until we came to a huge bubble. This seemed to be the center, the center from which all the pods emanated. Throughout the building, on the ceiling of every corridor, corridor there were these round, bluish-black, luminous, yet expressionless eyes watching with the eyes of a cow, but never blinking. These were the 360-degree lenses of the 24-7 closed-circuit TV monitoring system inside the bubbles that keep track of everything going on everywhere except inside the cells. Not only could reality be monitored in real time, but the past could be rewound and reviewed with the press of a button. It was the ultimate reality TV, with hours of mind-numbing content interspersed with the occasional blood and gut sequence of a crime drama, with the laugh-out-loud humor of a sitcom. The one-way black glass walls, the doors that could only be opened from the inside, and the enclosed toilet made the security inside these bubbles more impressive than the cockpit of a 747. At this point, I was struck by how much everything about Lindsay was like a cheap Star Trek set. I would not have been quite, I would have been quite comfortable to see Captain Kirk or Captain Picard wearing their unisex jumpsuits disappearing into a black bubble. Then we turned down a corridor where the sounds of women's voices echoing against the cinder block walls led us to a, a barred barrier. Somewhere, someone somewhere inside a mini bubble must have detected our presence the door clicked open. The women's pod consisted of two living units, one adjoining floor to ceiling plexiglass wall facing a raised platform where a mini bubble was located. Inside you could very faintly see the dull glow of TV monitors, but otherwise it was just a black glass walled room where an unknown number of guards resided. It felt a bit like looking at the glass wall of a police interrogation room where you know a number of detectors, detectives are watching you, sight unseen. 
The guards led me up to the glass entrance door of one of the units, which automatically click, clicked open and then disappeared into the mini bubble. Even the exercise yard was impeccably secure and sterile, surrounded by three brick walls, one plexiglass wall, and a plexiglass ceiling, so we could go out for our one hour of daily exercise, rain or shine. There was not a speck of gravel, grass, or any living thing in the yard, just asphalt. When I did eventually go out for our daily hour of exercise, I would pretend the prison was a module on the moon. We were completely contained inside concrete without another plant or living organism other than the guards and other prisoners. Not even spiders and mice could survive here. Although I was always vigilant, I never saw even a trace of a spider's web, dead fly, dried up leaf, or mouse turd. The only contact we had with the natural world was by looking up at the sky through the plexiglass ceiling in the yard to watch a cloud or occasional bird fly silently by. <clears throat> The only other windows I encountered were these four foot high but six inch wide windows in each cell that would be impossible to escape from even if the glass was broken, unless you were a new superhero like what rubber woman. The vista these windows faced was the wall of the next arm of the building separated by a swath of grass. I had to admit the pod was a marvel of human warehousing design. Just one guard inside the mini bubble could effectively control the daily lives of 32 women without ever stepping foot outside the bubble. No latex gloves required. By constructing the bubble a few feet above the floor of the, of the level of the rest of the pod, the guards could survey all the activities taking place inside the two separate living areas, plus two separate activity rooms, the exercise yard, the segregation area, the healthcare unit, without ever leaving their swivel chairs. The only time the guards really needed to enter the living units was when there was a disturbance or to carry out a cell or strip search. In the future, they'll just use robots. In the short time I was there, the only disturbance involved a table of four women raising their voices in a disagreement over what channel to watch. The guards simply threatened through the intercom system to lock us down if everyone didn't quiet down. The women did quiet down, but not quickly enough. So within the hour, backup arrived, followed by a cell and strip search. These searches were used both as punishment and a deterrent to future disturbances that might be interpreted as a threat to the good order of the institution. Security in the 21st century is all about deterrence. The guards were conveniently and securely situated inside their own self-contained bubble from which they could orchestrate their own Machiavellian horror show if they were bored. Without ever setting foot inside the calm room, they could charge us, order us locked down, or do anything else they might, that might stir up the pot. When they, then they could just sit back and watch while we began imploding and exploding on each other. The sinister beauty of it all was that in the end, we could only hold grudges against each other because the real source of our anger was, was so out of reach. Like someone driving down the highway becomes consumed by road rage after learning over their cell phone that their loved one is having an affair. The next person that cuts them off gets his head blown off. Through my prison abolition work, I'd heard about the classic prison architecture, the panopticon, the panopticon, first designed in 1785 by Jeremy Bentham, a British philosopher who described his design best, a new mode of attaining power of mind over mind in a quantity hitherto without example. The now defunct Kingston Penitentiary was a textbook example of panopticon architecture when it was built in 1835. Inside a high rotunda, tier upon tier of cells constructed against a circular outer wall encircled the central guard tower in such a way that the guards could watch the prisoners without being seen. A singular prisoner among hundreds could never see if a guard was actually observing him but was aware that he could be observed at any time. The cumulative psychological effect was that prisoners would regulate their own behavior, knowing that they could never be sure whether or not they were actually under surveillance. In this way, the few could guard the many. The architectural design of the prison for women in Quinty strayed from the original principle of the panopticon, particularly in terms of surveillance. Other than actually patrolling past the cells, the guards, were, the guards relied heavily on creating stories of legendary consequences for bad behavior that were passed down from prisoner to prisoner. 
<clears throat> the old school notion of deterrence through example. But the prison architecture of the 21st century in the form of popular prison design and high-tech surveillance techniques has remained true to the inspiration of Jeremy Bentham, creating the illusion that one is always under surveillance. The Feng Shui is not the only Kafkaesque aspect of CE's of Lindsay. So too is the bureaucracy in that the rules and procedures are based on the universe, universal principle that what is good for one is good for all. The result is an oppressive bureaucracy bordering on the absurd. Washing your hair with your own shampoo is legal, whereas sharing some with a newcomer who has none is not. Regardless of how reasonable an explanation you offer a guard for being one minute late entering your cell or at lockup, you can still be charged with refusing to obey a direct order. <coughs> the boundaries defining the legality or illegality of the endless list of rules that control the minutiae of daily life are fluid. I arrived during the lunch hour when everyone was locked down. At least Lindsay was not so overpopulated that the prisoners were triple bunked because they had been in Quinty. But then Lindsay had only been operational for about five years. My cellmate was also on methadone, so I naturally asked her when we normally got our methadone. She explained that I probably wouldn't have to see the doctor since I was only going to be there for a few days before I could transfer to Grand Valley. To my surprise, she mentioned the name of the same shrink, Dr. Duncan Scott, who renewed my methadone prescription in Quinty. He was the same shrink who treated the 250 prisoners in Quinty, as well as the 1,200 prisoners in Lindsay. This was no small feat, because a disproportionate number of prisoners would need to see the shrink compared to a similar population from the outside world. The shrink would be responsible not only for renewing prescriptions, but also for treatment, which is synonymous with medication in prison. This explained why, during my doctor's appointment in Quinty, there had been a guard in the background, impatiently shuffling about as though the three minutes I was actually seated talking with the shrink for three hours. The other surprise associated with Dr. Duncan Scott was the fact that his father, Dr. George Scott, was the infamous psychiatrist who worked for Correctional Services of Canada during the 60s and 70s, running a notorious LSD pro program in, in the prison for women. He was the same doctor who had subjected 17-year-old Dorothy Proctor, the woman I'd met many years earlier in the prison for women, to his LSD program. Dorothy was one of 24 women who had successfully sued Dr. George Scott in the late 90s for subjecting them to LSD, sensory deprivation, and electric shock treatment during their imprisonment in Deeper Dice. So that's, uh, you know, just sort of a bit of a description of what I think the modern day, a lot of modern day, prisons all over the United States and Canada are modeled after that basic, uh, you know, all-pervasive surveillance technique. Guards are becoming less and less necessary. So, put on my other glasses. Um, um, so anyways, I, uh, my, my, I'm a prison abolitionist, and I would just, if I had to, I'd describe myself as an anarchist. And um, my first um, Prisoner's Justice Day was in 1980. Does anybody, are you guys familiar with Prisoner's Justice Day? I'll try to make it sort of brief. Prisoner's Justice Day started back in the 70s when Millhaven Penitentiary for Men is in Ontario. And um, over a two year period in the mid 70s, two men in segregation. One of them slashed. He was a prisoner activist and was supposed to be released on a certain date from segregation, but wasn't. So he got upset and slashed. And some of the prisoners around him, well, they knew that he'd slashed. And so they were pushing their emergency buttons in their cells. And the guards in the towers had disconnected their emergency buttons, so nobody arrived. Eventually, they were screaming, yelling, and one guard arrived. And Generally, there's a rule that only one guard can enter the cell. So he just basically stood there while he waited for a nurse and watched this guy, and he nailed him with his name bleed out, and he, of course, he died. So the next year, another man named Bobby Landers had been shipped from Quebec in Archibald, where he'd been kind of like a prisoner activist, so he shipped to Belhaven. He was also in segregation, and he had a heart attack. And the guys in segregation around him again could, could hear that he was having a medical emergency once, this is a year later, began to push the emergency, but he still did. 
you know, there was no response in the, in the guard towers, and he died of a heart attack. So the guys in Millhaven, they decided that every August 10th that they were going to refuse to work or eat in, in, in honor and in memory of all the prisoners who died at this point in Canada, at that point in Canada, and it's still the case every August 10th. Um, prisoners fast for 24 hours and refuse to work. And on the outside, as the prison abolition movement has grown, People don't necessarily fast, but they use that opportunity to, to organize some kind of public awareness raising or trying to expose an issue. So I started my, um, oh, my, my, my sort of awareness began of prison, of, you know, prison abolition back in 1980, quite a long time ago, um, in Toronto where I met a group of people who started the Bulldozer Collective, which is also a go back. It was the first collective to, um, they contacted prisoners through letters and asked them if they wanted to publicize or publish, have their letters published, they would publish them in a, in a paper they called Bulldozer, the only vehicle for prison reform. This little, you know, little catchphrase there, I thought it was a great title. Anyways, so um, these people had organized a 24-hour vigil at Toronto City Hall. We were giving out these leaflets, um, and we were trying to, you know, educate people about this at this point in history, the first standalone isolation prison in the states. There was only one we called Marion in Marion, Illinois, and so we were outraged, and we were, you know, telling everybody about it. And when I look back on it, you know, it's really I think. That prison abolition has become not just sort of a gut instinct or sort of an ideological view that I, at that point, had sort of developed from, from listening to others, but just through my own experience and through, you know, evidence. Uh, times have changed and unfortunately they have not improved. I mean, there are at this point, I don't know how many, I could have Googled it, but there are many, many standalone isolation prisons in the United States now and in Canada. There are still men in segregation in various federal prisons, but they also have one standalone uh, segregation prison in St. Anne de Plain, Quebec. And uh, after they closed the prison for women in 2000, they opened six federal prisons for women across Canada. And eventually, I'll get into that a little later, but when I actually went, or was um, admitted into one of these federal new federal prisons for women, into the maximum security unit, it's actually very, very similar to a, to a special handling unit. So in other words, except for the Ochima Oki Lodge, which is supposed to be the, you know, like a, a sort of a healing center prison, but it isn't, um, all, like five of the federal prisons for women all have these little tiny maximum security units that hold a maximum of 30 women, like a whole building just for 30 women. And um, that's their maximum capacity. And about four or five cells are for segregated women, and the rest are put in pots. <coughs> so, anyways, um, you know, I was very disappointed by that. Um, so, not too long ago, I met a friend of mine in a coffee shop, and she has just been released from Grand Valley, the new federal prison in Ontario, which is, like I said, it's like a clone of your Fraser Valley. Prison for Women, and we had also been in P4W or the Prison for Women, which is now closed. So we were sort of reminiscing, you know, because she had been in Grand Valley for about seven years. She's a lifer like I am, and she had been charged with dangerous driving and ended up being there for seven years, just based on every time she went up for parole, they would have reports that had been written by guards, you know, allegations. Not, she'd never been convicted in the institutional court of anything. But this is just how the system has really declined. So constantly her, her, her applications for passes or for parole were denied based on this. So we were, you know, like I said, reminiscing. And after a little while, we realized like, how we were actually looking back fondly at P4W, you know, like it was some really great place because in contrast to the new prisons, it was actually really a lot better. It was not great by any stretch, but you know, in P4W, despite many problems, everybody, you had your own cell. 
and when you were, like I spent the entire time in the same cell on a range of 50 women. So you developed very strong relationships with the other women, that was a positive thing. Um, you could sort of settle in, and I don't want to be painting a picture of people, the prison for women is this great place, but you know, there was work, everybody had, you know, either work in the shops or in the kitchen, and uh, like I said, I don't want to, I'm not going to get too much into P4W, but in retrospect, uh, the new prisons are, have really, are much, much worse than, I, I've met a number of women who've been involved and they all felt that the prison for women was a big improvement. So we were talking about, both of us had been in the maximum security, okay, I, I was suspended in 2006. I was actually showing a, a film of a prisoner's justice day while there was a, a, um, a seminar being run by a lawyer who was telling people what their civil rights were at a, at a, at a, blockade, at a blockade. People were going to blockade uh, the entrance to a Collins Bay in Ontario. So she was just telling people what their rights were if, if the cops came. And because I showed that film, I was suspended. And I was, um, the first time in 2006, I went to Grand Valley. Now, the prison for women had been closed after um, at, at, there had been an incident in which a bunch of women in segregation, they'd been in a fight with the guards. So when they were put in segregation, they were really uptight. They were, you know, yelling, screaming and stuff. So they sent over the goon squad through a tunnel that ran between Kingston Penitentiary and P4W. And the guards, when they come, when they came through that tunnel, they would like have their shields and they'd be banging their batons on the on the on the shield, so you could hear them coming like really loud. And when they got there, they cut off all the women's clothes with their scissors. And some and they always take these things like that's one of the rules that they had to just like the cops are supposed to. I don't know if it's true anymore. If they always do in the states in some places, they have those sort of like GoPro things on their on their somewhere on their body. But at any rate, they had to videotape this. This is one of the law rules. But this happened quite frequently, that the, that the goon squad would come over if there was ever a disturbance. So this was not a shock to any of us, right? But somehow this video of the guards, the goon squad, cutting off the women's clothes and then leaving them hogtied in their cells and, uh, ended up being um, somehow surreptitiously it got out of the prison and got into the hands of the Fifth Estate. So they played it on the Fifth Estate. I don't know if you've ever seen it. It was an investigative journalism show. So people were really outraged to see this, like a kind of a grainy porno film almost, you know? And so the outcome of that was that there was this big um, inquiry into events. They call it events at Prison for Women. And the judge who ran the inquiry, she recommended that P4W close and that they um, instead open these six new federal prisons in different regions across Canada to make the prisons more accessible to the women in wherever they lived, and that the programs be more women-centered and more indigenous-centered. So when I first went to Grand Valley in 2006, uh, after, you know, I've been in Quinty again for a while, I had to admit, I, was at, uh, I thought, well, wow, this is pretty cool because what it was, was a, a fairly large compound with about, I don't know, seven, I can't remember, seven or ten, what at the time the prisoners were describing as bungalows. And that's what they looked like. There was like a bunch of like these bungalows, a little circular drive, uh, you know, around a little circular drive. There were ten women in each bungalow and a cook in each, each, each bungalow. One of the prisoners was the cook. You could go outside uh, anywhere, any time between 8 in the morning and 10 o'clock at night. The guards would come around three times a day and do count. And I tried to not like it, but I thought, wow, this is kind of almost like a women's commune, you know? Um, but I was only there for a very short time. But even then, I realized that there was no food in our house. And it took me a little while to realize that back in 1984, for example, the highest amount a prisoner could make, in, you know, male, female, anywhere in Canada, the federal system was $6.90 as the maximum. 250 
if you were unemployed and a dollar a day if you refused to work if you were given a job. So by 2006, the, the, the pay was still the same. 690 was the maximum you could make, and there were very few jobs actually on this site. Per day. No. Per day. Per day. Did no. I say per hour? No, I was just oh, no, 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 per day. per day. Which may not even sound that bad, but you have to remember that there's no in, there's no internet access. There never has been, and still isn't. So if you want to communicate with your family, you have to go old school with postage stamps or like what I described, the Millennium phone system, which is all collect calls, and it's higher than normal because it's a special phone system for the prison system. So what was happening was the cooks who usually got the jobs because they were sort of had higher seniority, often in the population, and uh, it was sort of like a prestigious job. You know, like the food was being used as bl out on the black market within the prison compound. Like when prisoners don't get enough pay, you know, like people have to, they want to see their families, right? They have, you know, you want to be, and in this case, you know, a lot of people were buying food on canteen too, because in a lot of the houses, in most of the houses, in fact, the cooks were using the food as, uh, you know, as a black market item. And at that point, smoking was starting to be phased out, you know, so tobacco was becoming a black market item, and then the usual, you know, drug transactions and that. So there were, there were glim glimmers that things were not as good as I thought. But then when I went back in 2012, like this is during Harper's era, you know, and he had instituted all these law and order so-called, you know, reforms with minimum sentencing laws, t tightening up and parole regulations. The prison population was escalating across Canada, as it was in the States, too. So when I arrived from a suspension in 2012, the same prison that I originally thought, like against all my instincts, that it was okay. There was all these, they were building more bungalows. So the, the whole, year, there had been a little central sort of green space with a picnic table, trees, you know, where people where women could hang out. It was all covered in construction equipment. They had portables, because they were building a minimum security unit as well within the prison. They were expanding the number of segregation cells. And then this time, and I think again, it's a reflection of Harper being in power, the parole people, even though I've been out for over 20 years, I, I actually owned like a little farm sort of thing, like 20 acres. I was, have been, you know, I was considered minimum security for all these years. Overnight, I was classified as maximum security, and I was put in that maximum security unit in Grand Valley. So it's pretty sad when I, when I looked out on the compound to see that, you know, it was just covered in construction equipment, you know, and 20% of the population was being double bunked. And the maximum security unit that Bobby and I, my friend, were, um, you know, were sort of reminiscing about in, in a bad way was really sort of shocking to me just because it was like a special handling unit. Um, there were women in there. Anybody who's, who's convicted of life at that time, Harper had made it mandatory that you had to spend two years as a maximum security prisoner. So you had to spend two years on this little tiny unit, which was maybe the length of this room. Well, maybe a little longer. Five cells in a row. And then there was a sixth cell that was in a bathroom shower stall. And then there was a corridor. You could walk. Outside the cells would be a little corridor in another little sort of space where they had kitchen cabinets along the wall, and then there'd be a picnic table that was bolted to the floor, and then further down there'd be two sofas that were just too small for five people. Like, there was two sofas that would fit just two people. With They were all wood, except for like few tawn pads. So you couldn't really, you know, get comfortable. And um, so you were locked up with these same five women for months, and in some cases, like for these women who'd been, who were serving life sentence, had just been convicted of life, uh, would be there for a minimum of two years. And the thing about life lifers, especially in, in, in the case of women, more than half the women who get convicted of murder have murdered either their spouse or their partner, and had already reported that person as having abused them. You know, you know they're almost always well, more than half the women in, uh, have, have been in abusive relationships and have killed their partner or has been... Uh, so a lot, more than, 
more than average, the, the women who are serving life sentences generally tend to be like otherwise very, you know, normal, sort of like, you know, like church going, often, you know, housewives that you really uh, were not living um, on any, in any kind of criminal way other than having killed their husband. So it was kind of uh, just sad to see that they had to be stuck on these maximum security units for so long. Um, and again, the same thing with the surveillance that I was talking about at Lindsay. Even though it was a very small unit and you only got out for an hour a day to exercise in the yard, you had on both ends of the unit were those cow eyes, you know, the 360 degree closed circuit TV cameras that were always on. And there was a guard in another area of the building who that was their full time job, just to sit and watch the screens to monitor what was going on in the three pots. There were three pots building with five women in each pot and it's and sometimes nine as time went on because of overpopulation so you'd be double bound and then as well there'd be two intercom systems I remember shortly after I got there um, I sort of friends with this I just sort of met this woman and friends with her and she was trying to put the air polish on she couldn't she was a little chubby she couldn't quite reach her toes so she asked me if I put nail polish on her toes and so she said, I said, sure. So she put her feet on my lap. And as soon as she did, the guard, and you hear a voice yelling out, no physical contact. But you weren't allowed any type of physical contact on these, you know, on these pods, whether it was like a handshake or hugging somebody or a horse play. Like it didn't matter what it was, the voice would boom out. Um, in, the, in the compounds, um, you know, women would have, it was, you know, it's not uncommon in the prisons for women to have, um, you know, intimate relationships, more common than perhaps on the street, and it's kind of a policy of, like, the American army, don't ask, don't tell sort of thing, that the administration kind of uh, looks away, you know, that relationships on the compound are still used as sort of a social control mechanism, like, if they know you're involved with another woman, and you're both living in the same unit, which used to be called bungalows in the beginning, but as women became more politicized, and as the place becomes more oppressive, the language reflects that. Nobody calls them bungalows, the other units, which is what they are, they're, they're still prisons. But they, they will separate women, or put, or maybe, you know, uh, charge somebody, and put, put one of them in the maximum security or transfer them. So relationships nowadays are often used as control, they, they use different social control methods. And the other thing that really surprised me was that, well, there's a lot of things. But the, um, so you're, okay, but before I get into that, I should say that this kind of uh, all pervasive surveillance also really creates a lot of paranoia. Uh, for example, again, you start learning to speak very quietly, like, you know, there's those two sofas that are there bolted down. So, you know, you're watching a show with somebody and people talk, but they start, everybody starts talking in very low tone, starting to develop little hand signals and odd, like a, a whole different world of communication that's very subtle and quiet, you know? So this, just so I have the woman with the nail polish on her toes, she was. Uh, she had actually come into into GVI with a six-year sentence for manslaughter, but she had. Um, she was very young, and I don't know if she had mental health issues before, but she developed them pretty quickly after she got there. And but, but really, things happened to her. Like she, I don't know. I, I I'm pretty sure she had a little a difficulty with impulse control. Like you learn really quickly in prison that if a guard does something, like tells you to do something. Saying fuck off is really like not worth it because you're going to end up going to segregation. So most people just sort of put up with a certain level of bullshit because it's just otherwise you're going to be in there forever. Well, this is what happened to her. She was in there forever. Like, um, like she was when I met her. This was her 15th year because she escalated from like refusing to obey direct orders, as they call it, to acting out. Like if a guard pissed her off, she'd go and trash herself. Now, back in the olden days, in, in the prison for women, if you trashed your cell, you would go to institutional court and you'd go, go to segregation for a period of time. Nowadays, if you trash your cell, they send you to outside court. 
you go to an outside court in the community and get charged with destruction of public property, right? And she was known for this, like she would trash her cell or trash the whole pod. Or, so she was always in, in either, she'd been in segregation essentially for 15 years. Mm-hmm. Ashley Smith, which you, you may have heard of her, maybe I won't get into, into that, but um, a young woman who was in, uh, again, Grand Valley. She had originally got put, in, put um, into the juvenile system because she threw crab apples at a post, postal worker who she thought was ripping off her needles, welfare check, and she was repeatedly charged. Like some of these women, and again, they're always indigenous. The first one I just talked to you about is, was indigenous. The one who eventually was doing 15 years, but originally sent to the six. Ashley Smith was also indigenous. It's always very telling. And so she did so much time in the juvenile system that they shipped her up to uh, adult prison. She was moved about constantly because of, behave, they would say, behavioral issues. But she eventually ended, she developed a bit of a, a, um, a way of uh, resisting by tying ligatures around her, and her neck, you know. And so she, was, she would end up in segregation, guards would be watching her, and she would sort of stash little bits of sheets and things in her, up her vagina. And, figure out ways of putting things up there that she could cut sheets with and was always trying to hang, not, you know, hang herself. And so she always had guards watching her. And eventually what happened with Ashley Smith was Correctional Services of Canada headquarters, they, they were kind of getting fed up, I think, because it was costing them so much money to have this one woman constantly under surveillance. So they had actually put out a directive that they were not to go into her cell unless they thought she was going to die. And so one day she did. She was, she, and there are videos. I mean, this didn't have too long ago. You could Google Ashley Smith and look this up yourself. So she had laid uh, behind her cot and, and tied her ligature to, to uh, her bed. And the guards she left her for 45 minutes, I believe it was. Hmm? I think she drank. She drank uh, toilet. No, she really did hang herself. You, you could Google it on your phone while I'm talking. With the guards watching. Yeah, they watched. Yeah, and they were charged with manslaughter, but they yeah. got acquitted yeah, and all of that. that. And the people in Nashville headquarters were never charged, even yeah. though they had evidence, like mm-hmm. memos that were sent to Grand Valley. Yeah. So this is why uh, um, my, the, the woman I was referring to before, they kept letting her out of set into the pause because they didn't want another Ashley Smith mm-hmm. thing to happen. But... So this is what I'm, why I'm describing what what was what happened when I was there once, just to show you how paranoia and mental illness can happen. Because I was sitting there one day with some women, and they were talking about how they were going, they were describing how some of the women in the compound were putting shit in the PC's food, and PC means protective custody women, because they no longer keep protective custody people in special uh, areas, unless you're in a man's maximum security unit, then they do, because some of the guys that are in there for 25 years are going to just kill them for sure, right? But in the women's prison, they do put them in population. So this woman, who I've been talking about here, she only, because you can't, you know, nobody talks loud, you have, this is what, the, what happens if you're living in this little tiny area, she just heard the, the putting shit, you know, shit food and assumed that it was her. So she started trashing, you know, taking food out of the fridge and throwing it around in the coffee percolator. And she got taken to segregation. But that's just sort of an example. And it's not uncommon for, you know, people to develop mental illness from the living conditions. And the other, one thing that I also, like, kind of couldn't believe either got there. It just seems so weird. But you guys are criminology students? Okay. Well, they have these two, like they have dynamic and static security models. Have you heard of that? In prisons? Like, static security is the, is the is things like walls, bars, the, the audiovisual surveillance, it's, you know, immovable objects that are used for security. But then they call dynamic security models are, like in, in this case, 
it was called, they, they, they employed what they call a, a dynamic security model in all maximum security units for women. They call it DBT, or dialectical behavior therapy. Kind of sounds Marxist, right? But they, uh, it isn't. But anyways, dialectical behavior therapy, again, if you Google it, it's actually not that bad of a thing. Like it was um, developed by this woman, Marsha Linehan, to deal mainly with bipolar disorder and serious cases of chronic depression. And it, it, how it works is it, it, it's supposed to be a way of treating people without having to get to the root cause of their problem. So if you have bipolar disorder um, and, you, and your um, psychologist, psychiatrist decides to use dialectical behavior therapy, you may realize that you can't actually solve the root, co the root cause of the problem, right? So the person learns how to modify their behavior and, and figure out ways of changing their attitude to be able to function better, you know? So um, I've, I've known people who have, you, who have uh, been treated using DBT, they call it, outside prison and say that it's not a bad technique because you can't always solve the root ca cause of it. But in, but in the maximum security unit, everybody is being <coughs> treated with DBT. Um, you have to go to classes or see a psychologist. And the problem is because there's an assumption in prison that your the crime is, is a function of your behavior, of sort of maladaptive behavior. Like it's really the prisoner's fault, you know, the individual. That you have to learn how to change your behavior, change your norms, and that sort of thing. And the big problem is that it's an involuntary treatment as well. Like it's, you don't decide, hey, I think I need help. It's sort of, you know, it's not sort of, but it is um, mandatory to go to these classes. And, uh, they, and then a lot of people have DBT as part of their long-term, what they call correctional, you probably heard correctional plans. So they can, which in, in the maximum security unit, they can't have the guards treating the, the, the prisoners on the maximum security unit because really it's just too dangerous. It's not really suitable. But what they do is they recommend to people who they think have more behavioral issues, let's say, than others, and can't just be treated by seeing a psychiatrist or being involved in these group therapy sessions that they have in the maximum security unit in these little activity build rooms that they have. So they recommend that you go to what they call the structured living environment, which is one unit or bungalow that is strictly used for DBT. So that you, if you refuse to, to participate in it, it's kind of like an offer you can't refuse, right? Because if you say, I don't want to go to sleep, well, then you don't get out of the maximum security unit because you're not following your correctional plan. And I really just found that all very disturbing, you know? I was only suspended. I, I actually saw the parole board and they let me out because it really was weird and outrageous, I think, but they, they in some way must have thought so because they released me. So I didn't have to participate in DBT, but if I had stayed, I, I would have had to see or a psychologist or psychiatrist, even though, I mean, I don't think I have any mental issues, but maybe because I'm just joking out here. So anyways, um, yeah, so then I could go on until 9 o'clock on this, but I won't. I'll just move on here a little bit. So I wrote this book, and um, my uh, it's about prison. And uh, I, to I showed a friend of mine who I was in prison with, and she goes, oh, I hope it's not another poor me book. And I knew right away what she meant, you know, because she hadn't read it or anything. But everybody pretty much who's in prison really doesn't want to be, see themselves as a sort of pitiful, helpless person, you know? Like, who wants to be treated that way? So, anyways, she also was the same person who we have been, have been involved in this campaign to have a little memorial garden outside the prison for women now that it's closed and a developer has bought it. And she was the same woman who decided, like who suggested, I thought it was a great idea, to call, uh, to dedicate this to our fallen sisters. And I like that, that uh, phrase, it's sort of a play on fallen soldiers. But 
it, it brings up, it, con it has that connotation that you really are in a state of constant conflict, like, like a soldier would in war. Um, and there's a lot of similarities between soldiers and prisoners in, in a lot of ways, you know. Um, soldiers also come from the working class, or as Marxists would say, the lumping, you know, like below the people who are unemployed. Um, another thing that reminded me, of, that I learned to, that reminded me of soldiers was, in the short time that I spent maximum security in the unit, they moved me twice from one pod to the next, and I was only there for about two months. And I noticed people were being moved for no reason at all. You know, it was very weird. I was trying to figure out why are they moving these people? Because it's very disruptive. Like if you're in the same cell, like it's hard enough when you go to prison, but if you get, you know, you just settle in with these five people, which is hard, and then all of a sudden after about three weeks you're moved to another pod. And there's, you know, everybody's got to sort of reestablish the hierarchy, you gotta meet new people. It's like being moved in high school, I guess, every six months. And it not only seemed disruptive to the prisoners, but I thought it must be harder for the administration, too, because there's always turbulence and people are off kilter, you know? So I phoned a friend of mine one time on the street, and he said, uh, and I said, told him about this, and he, he was in, and had enlisted in the army when he was young. And he said that's what they do in the barracks, too, when you enlist, that they move you frequently because they don't want you to, do, they, he said in the army it was pretty clear that they really don't want the soldiers to develop stronger allegiances with one another than with their commanding officers. And then it started making sense to me because they obviously don't want the women in the pods to become so close and so tight that if they say, like what happened with my friend when she was trashing the pod, like, you know, they, they as soon as she started trashing her pod, they're there at the door, the guard, instantly. And there's and they get back and you're so you know. Well, we did go back at ourselves, but if you have this super strong bond, you may not, you know, like, because if the prisoners don't obey, you know, and the deconstruction of the individual, like, I would assume that, I don't know if it's criminology students that are necessarily, but there must be people in the university that study how to deconstruct the individual, you know, and, and certainly soldiers, you know, you do not want them to have autonomy, super strong bonds of solidarity in all to the point where they are willing to disobey the commanding officer if you're asked to like make a you know a charge that is relatively suicidal you know what I mean and it's the same with the prisoners so much of prison is designed to cause the individual to become extremely obedient to authority like to see your kids you know, get out of the past and, you know there's a million reasons so I just think that there's a lot of similarities between soldiers and prisoners. And somewhere along the line here, I'm sort of weaving around a little bit, um, I had reread re this iconic book from the 60s, which, is, which I think is really good, called, <coughs> written by Franz Fanning, called Wretched of the Earth. Mm -hmm. And he was a psychiatrist who worked during the Algerian War against the French colonialists. And as a psychiatrist, he wrote this book. It was about the Algerian war against the French colonialists. But he in, in explained in this book a lot of the behavior of the Algerians. Like, for instance, there was a lot of, of violence that was going on amongst the, the native Algerians themselves, right? And in this book, you have to read it because he's going to explain it way better than me. He explains how, in his theory or in his experience, that it is like a 